Good evening. Ah. Hello. This is Sundry Sports for Monday, August 10th. And we'll start with NASCAR. Kevin Harvick holds off Hamlin and sweeps Michigan. Kevin Harvick's victory in Sunday's Consumers Energy 400. I'm pretty tired of these stupid names. Kind of sucks. All the, these these names suck. The names that they have to give the races just because of who's sponsoring. Consumers Energy 400 at Michigan International Speedway gave the number four Stuart Haas Racing Ford team a weekend race sweep and a whole lot of momentum as the NASCAR Cup Series closes out its regular season schedule at the end of this month. Harvick's win is a series best sixth of the season. Good for him. Uh, Brad Keselowski drives number two Ford Mustang to second place finish. Brad Keselowski finished second in the Firekeepers Casino 400 at Michigan International. Firekeepers Casino 400. Blaney Keselowski crash for lead in second Michigan race. Team Penske drivers tangled in the final stage of Sunday's Consumers Energy 400 NASCAR race. Report Bubba Wallace says he has offer from Chip Ganassi. Richard Petty Motorsports driver Bubba Wallace confirmed to NBC Sports that Chip Ganassi is that another the name of another racing team. Whatever. Eric Jones blindsided a little bit by JGR's decision for 2021. Eric Jones said Sunday that he was mildly surprised when told that he wouldn't return to his team that he's on right now. I read about that. I didn't realize that that announcement was the first thing he had heard of it. That's kind of uncool. NASCAR on TV schedule, August 10th through 16th, 2020. Which channels have NASCAR uh, programming this week? Well, apparently it's Fox and NBC because, you know, those are the channels that are on that picture right there. Chase Elliott places 7th at Michigan International Speedway. Chase Elliott finished 7th in the Firekeepers Casino 400 at Michigan International Speedway. Good for him. I think that was, that was, so that was the Saturday race. And then the other one, Consumer, Consumer's Energy, whatever. I think that was Sunday. Weekend schedule for Daytona Road Course. Full schedule for Daytona Road Course, Friday, August 14th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, final practice, no TV 5 something. So you can look at the full schedule for Daytona next week. Moving on, Dallas Cowboys newsletter, 10 takeaways. Head coach Mike McCarthy touched on a variety of issues in his Friday press conference, including possible position changes, injuries, key dates, and more. Here are 10 topics of discussion from the new coach. We sort of read about that last night also. Unique challenges. Ask a rookie what kind of issues they typically deal with in their first season in the NFL, and you'll like likely get a variety of answers. For tackle Isaac Alarcon, it's all that and even a bit more. Mailbag. What to make of Jalen Smith's switch. Positivity. That's what we make of it. Jalen Smith is going to be awesome. That's what I say. And what I say goes. Cowboys Wire. Cowboys News. McCarthy talks position changes. Love for Prescott. Yes, we read that yesterday. And also this Cowboys news, so Chris, Chris Westry, yes, I read that headline. Cowboys news. Oh, so the, the newest one is way down here, the fourth thing. I just don't get it. Elliot, a primary focus. Prescott's agent leaves CAA defensive rookie impact. All right, since this is actually new. From August 9th. So that was yesterday. Yeah, that's the newest we get with Cowboys Wire. New Dallas head coach Mike McCarthy has a three-headed monster at wide receiver, but reiterated on Friday his stance from when he first got hired, what Ezekiel Elliott's role would be. 
Dak Prescott's agent Todd France has parted ways with CAA, and it could affect future contract negotiations if the Cowboys' signal caller stays with the agency. Oh, so, okay, so CAA is the agency. His agent left the agency. I hope he stays with the agency because his agent sucks. The Cowboys filled several holes defensively through the NFL draft, but just how much will they be able to contribute in year one? Antoine Woods signed his ERFA tender, but with several additions at defensive tackle through free agency in the draft, will he be the odd man out? How an aggressive offense will help the Cowboys' defense, whether or not the 2020 season is Sean Lee's last, and how Isaac Alarcon Garcia used the NFL's International Player Pathway Program in Florida to make it to the pros are covered in the news and notes. From conservative to explosive, how an aggressive Cowboys offense will also help their defense. Mike McCarthy has all the tools offensively to help the Cowboys' revamped defense be successful this season. I agree. Let's do that. Cowboys' defensive rookie breakdown. How much help will they bring this season? Trevon Diggs, Neville Gallimore, Bradley Anai, and Reggie Robinson bring youth and versatility to the Cowboys' defense. But how much will it help in 2020? I guess we'll see. Tweet from somebody named Liz Mullen. CAA sports and powerful NFL agent Todd France have confirmed to SBJSBD, whatever that is, that they have mutually agreed to part ways. Cowboys Isaac Alarcon rides NFL international program on journey from Mexico. After having surgery to remove a benign cyst in his back, Isaac Alarcon used the NFL's International Player Pathway Program to make it to the pros. I don't know what that is, but okay. I'm sure they get people here legally, so that's good. And uh, the NFL is a merit-based system, so that's good too. Dallas Cowboys, is this Sean Lee's last season in the NFL? Fuck you! Even if he doesn't play anymore, he's still an awesome coach. He's been he's been basically coaching for 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 a few years now, hasn't he? You know, sort of a player coach type of thing. Could over a decade of abuse on his body mean the 2020 season is Sean Lee's swan song? Little's gone as planned for Mike McCarthy. Oh, Little's gone as planned. Okay, little little has gone as planned for Mike McCarthy. Now he tries to bring the Cowboys together while keeping them safely apart. Yeah. He must be so stressed out. The current COVID-19 panic has halted the start of Mike McCarthy's coaching tenure in Dallas. Now, with new safety protocols in place, he's trying to keep his new team together as much as possible. Mike McCarthy dishes on Dallas Cowboys camp, says Ezekiel Elliott will get his touches. New head coach Mike McCarthy talks about Amari Cooper's three 1,000-yard receiver comment, working with Kellen Moore, and how Ezekiel Elliott will be a primary focus this season. I believe the quote uh, specifically about what Amari Cooper said was, I like the way he thinks. And yeah, Ezekiel Elliott, I mean, I I firmly believe in my heart that Zeke can get 1,000 yards, even if the receiver, the three receivers also get a thousand yards. We can do it. We can do this. <sighs> if Jerry Rice is the greatest wide receiver of all time, then Emmett Smith is also the greatest running back of all time. Danny Phantom breaks down how, with the most rushing yards and rushing touchdowns in league history, Emmett Smith should be considered as the greatest running back of all time. Okay. Will defensive tackle Antoine Woods be a part of 2020 Dallas Cowboys? After adding Gerald McCoy, Dontari Poe, and Neville Gallimore to the defensive line, will there be enough snaps for Antoine Woods? I guess we'll see. Mm. Rico Dowdle wants to and can make Cowboys rush attack four-headed monster. Like I was in a car crash. Cowboys legend Darren Woodson details COVID battle. But did you die? Obviously not. Tank Lawrence opts in. Yes, Demarcus Lawrence is 
going to training camp. Is already at training camp, I guess, technically. Cowboys Van Der Esch healed and ready for a move to middle linebacker and on-field leader. Coaching turnover could attract turnover magnet Donovan Wilson to Cowboys rotation. And Reggie Robinson, perfect fit as Cowboys secondary works to figure out identity. We shall see. Next up, the ESPN Daily. Good morning! Colin Morikawa joined the PGA Tour 14 months ago. Since then, he has made 6,800... Oh, okay, 6,898,970 something dollars in on-course earnings. I am once again asking why my parents didn't foist golf upon me in the springtime of my youth. Freedom of choice is overrated. Mm -hmm. Here's your ESPN Daily. Listen up. Tom Brady takes Tampa. Uh, yeah, he, 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 moved, he moved to Tampa quite a long time ago. As the NFL regular season looms, Tom Brady is adjusting to his new role as quarterback for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. A different playbook, unfamiliar facilities, and a new climate all present challenges for the veteran quarterback. I'm sure he probably knows the playbook by now, honestly. Meanwhile, his Buccaneers teammates are adjusting to a new play caller under center. On today's episode of the ESPN Daily Podcast, ESPN's Jenna Lane brings us her reporting on how Brady is getting used to working in Tampa with a new team. Then, 18-year NFL quarterback veteran Josh McCown explains how difficult it is to learn a new playbook. McCown has learned 16 playbooks over the course of his long football career. Wow. Who won the weekend? You did this to yourselves. After the sports world was forced to a standstill for months, it brings me great joy to be able to say, the weekend was one for the books. There was an abundance of shenanigans, trash talk, and creative heckling, with a whole lot less people watching than probably they expected. Damian Lillard, Patrick Beverly, and Paul George got into it in the comments section. Draymond Green said... Devin Booker needs to get up out of Phoenix and subsequently got fined $50,000. Brooks Kepka, Kepka came for Dustin Johnson and subsequently got humbled. Hmm. Kevin Durant got into a weird Twitter exchange. At least he's consistent. I was referring to basketball, by the way. Uh, about the... Uh, Less viewers. Anyway, Kevin Durant got into a weird Twitter exchange. At least he's consistent. None of the aforementioned incidents even made our best of the weekend. That's how you know it's real. From Riley Curry dancing to Beyonce to Rob Lowe trolling the Astros, here's who won the weekend. Cover story, bringing joy back to baseball. Fernando Tatis Jr., is not meant to be confined in an apartment. He is constantly in motion. Whether he's manning shortstop for the San Diego Padres or away from the field, Tatis is dancing and gabbing and dapping and gesturing. This is not someone who slows down, not even for a second. He radiates joy. Tatis celebrated himself for the life of a restless soul with boundless energy. Calibrated, oh my goodness. Tatis calibrated himself for the life of a restless soul with boundless energy, and that life was good and perfect, really, until he walked off the field after a spring training game in Mar training game March 11th and into a new reality. In the five months since the coronavirus turned Tottis's world upside down, he spent time alone in his San Diego apartment ruminating on all the things he missed. His family, his friends, the intimacy of face-to-face -face interaction, and baseball. Tottis loves baseball. It's part of him. What Tatis does not yet realize is how symbiotic his relationship symbiotic symbiotic symbi symbiotic how symbiotic his relationship with baseball is. As much as it fulfills him, the game needs him. Since the Padres opener on july twenty fourth, all Tatis has done is play better than everyone else in the sport. He has eight home runs this season, tied with Aaron Judge for most in NFL and MLB, damn it. That's where my mind is. Always on football. 
Tied with Aaron Judge for most in MLB. Through the first quarter of the shortened 60-game season, nobody had more wins above replacement than the 21-year-old. His excellence isn't purely statistical either. Tadis's home runs are majestic. His bat flips righteous. His drip undeniable. I don't know what that means. As Jeff Passan writes, this is only the beginning. Things to care about. The silent shot heard round the world. Colin Morikawa delivered on golf's biggest stage and won the first major championship of the panic-plagued 2020 season on Sunday. The shot, an epic driver to the 16th green at TPC Harding Park that set up an eagle putt and a two-victory in the PGA Championship, should have elicited a boisterous reaction. The excitement should have been overwhelming. Instead, it barely evoked a whimper. As Morikawa won his first major, he was met with a smattering of cheers and claps, reminiscent of his college days at nearby Cal. Even though there wasn't much noise, Morikawa, who was in college just 15 months ago, loudly announced himself to the masses with that shot. Eight games that will swing the NBA playoff race this week. We're entering the final week of seeding game seeding games in the NBA restart, and so far the bubble has been nothing if not eventful. Luke Luca Don Doncic 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 has balled out. Mella has Mella Mello has moved up the all time scoring leaderboard. Dame Lillard has sent the Pelicans packing and Devin Booker has been legendary. Teams have a few more opportunities to improve their places in the standings. There are four teams pushing for the final spot in the Western Conference playoffs, and it's now guaranteed that there will be a play-in series. There won't be a play-in series in the East, but seeding and matchups are still up for grabs. To get your mind right for this stretch run... Stretch run? Our NBA experts broke down the eight games that will decide the playoff picture this week. Indiana Pacers versus Miami Heat times two. Dallas Mavericks versus Portland Trailblazers. Philadelphia 76ers versus Phoenix Suns. Toronto Raptors versus Philadelphia 76ers. Brooklyn Nets versus Portland Trailblazers. Dallas Mavericks versus Phoenix Suns. Houston Rockets versus Philadelphia 76ers. Things to watch. Another day, another bench-clearing brawl. The old adage about no hard feelings does apply here. Tempers flared when the Athletics and Astros faced off on Sunday, months after Houston's sign-stealing scandal was brought to light by Oakland pitcher Mike Fierce. Things got, got so heated that the benches cleared. So did the stands. Uh, weren't they already? After the A's, Ramon Laureano was hit by a pitch for the third time in the three-game series, with one out in the seventh. Loriano pointed at the pitcher, then began exchanging words with Astros hitting coach Alex Cintron, left first base, threw down his batting helmet, and began charging towards Cintron in the first base dugout. That's when Astros catcher Dustin Garneau left the bench to tackle Loriano, and a wild scene ensued. Stephen Curry with underrated media. After tackling the competition at the PGA Championship, 23-year-old Colin Morikawa had to face another daunting task, fielding questions from the media. Namely, he received questions from a little-known, one-man publication called Underrated that was thought up by Golden State Warriors star Stephen Curry minutes before Morikawa's new, new, news conference. After surprising Morikawa and asking if he is a leaderboard watcher, Curry got into the hard-hitting questions, such as, Do you need me to caddy for you in the future? Cute. Overheard. If you've won a major championship, you're a hell of a player. I mean, sort of hard to knock a guy who's got 21 wins on the PGA Tour, which is three times what Brooks has. Roy McElroy defending Dustin Johnson after Brooks cup comments that Johnson had only a single major to his name. Hmm. Remember when? On this date, 25 years ago, we learned why arming fans with objects that are meant to be thrown is a rookie move. In this instance, the aforementioned throwables were 15,000 souvenir baseballs intended to celebrate the Los Angeles Dodgers' previous Rookie of the Year winners. 
For unknown reasons, fans started throwing their balls on the field in the seventh inning. The first few balls, perhaps as many as a couple hundred, caused a six-minute delay. Rainfall subsided until just before the bottom of the ninth, when a ball landed near St. Louis Cardinals right fielder John Mabry. From there, things escalated quickly and culminated in the umpires making an abrupt decision. The game ended in forfeit. Oh my goodness. The Cardinals' 2-1 lead was ratified, but was officially recorded as a 9-0 win, as all forfeits are. Oh. Tom Henke got the save. It was the last forfeit to date in Major League Baseball. Wow. What's on tonight? All oh, stuff that we missed because I can't be counted on to do this before bedtime, after bedtime. Until next time, remember, over the weekend, Kevin Durant proved yet again why he is not to be trifled with on social media. When a random person made disparaging remarks about the Nets superstar, he followed that person's girlfriend on Twitter and liked all her pictures. I guess I'm sharing this to say things might seem bad on this Monday in 2020, but at least you're not as petty as KD. This has been your ESPN Daily for August 10th, 2020. Hmm... Moving on to Yahoo Sports, read and react. Trending. Colin Morikawa, 23, wins PGA Championship with Stunning Eagle. Cringe watch. Nat's ground crew can't get tarp unrolled during rain delay. Oh. A hole-in-one dropped at the PGA Championship and nobody cheered. Oh, well. Cleveland quarantines pitcher after he goes out on the town. <sighs> Excuse me. Sad. I hope his, I hope it was worth it. Sad that he has to be quarantined. Draymond Green hit with $50,000 fine for tampering comments while on TNT broadcast. The lead. Hopes dim for college football in 2020. Lame. By Jay Busby. Morning, friends. Positivity first. I spent the weekend watching the PGA Championship, NASCAR races, baseball games, and the NBA and NHL playoff races. That's a bounty of sports unimaginable a few months back. It was glorious. I could almost forget we were still in the middle of all this, as long as I didn't look too hard at the stands or at Twitter. Because while all those sports were going on, almost entirely without incident, a much bigger, darker story lurked just offshore. College football. For my money, the top-to-bottom most fascinating sport in America lurched ever closer to what appears inevitable, a shutdown for the fall 2020 season. The pebbles had been falling for some time, smaller FCS schools postponing or outright canceling their seasons, then came Saturday, when the Mid-American Conference announced that its 12 member schools were taking their ball and socially distancing from their season. In the Jenga Tower that is this year's college football season, the MAC, M-A-C, Mid-American Conference, okay, was one of those pieces that makes everything start to teeter. So even as optimism about other sports rode high, with the exception of the St. Louis Cardinals, no player or team across baseball, basketball, golf, NASCAR, or hockey tested positive over the weekend— the news turned ever darker for college football. R. Pete Thamel reported that Big Ten college presidents met Sunday night with cancellation or at least postponement of the football season as the prevailing sentiment. The difficulties of managing infection vectors, the long-term health risks to players, the liability exposure for universities, the possibility of infection for older coaches, staff, and fans, it all adds up to a grim conclusion, one that was an obvious possibility as far back as April. Uh huh. Controlling 130 massive football operations filled with 18 to 22 year old college students isn't like controlling a bubble full of millionaires. College football was always the unlikeliest sport to survive in a panic, and now it sure seems like our worst fears on that score are close to being realized. Within the next few days, the Big Ten could pull the plug on the season. Other conferences could soon follow, and man, that would hurt so, so much. If you're looking for hope, or at least a little less brutal reality, check out Dan Wetzel's column on how a Big Ten cancellation doesn't automatically mean every conference needs to follow them into oblivion. 
For better or worse, both the NCAA and this country have pursued a decentralized, to put it politely, coronavirus management strategy, and that could actually work in college football's favor. Other sports have proven it's possible to play games in a panic, and the NFL has yet to set the pace for football. If a conference is willing to wait and invest the money in mitigation and prevention, it could cobble together some form of a season yet. We're barreling into one of the most momentous weeks in college football history. Chances are it won't end well. We can always hope, but hope hasn't fared well so far. Enjoy those other sports, friends, because what we've already got might be all we get. Schwab. Five questions before NFL Week 1. Who will be Bears quarterback? Oz. Fight. As Astros throw down, don't socially distance. Uh Uh-huh. Let's get back to normal, shall we? Bushnell. Will positive cases affect Champions League? The kicker. That's a four-base error. Hey, at least it didn't go off his head. Oh. That sucks. Is he wearing his mask? Does he have it up? I can see his nose. It looks like it's kind of on over his mouth, though. Maybe. Oh, that's his beard. Never mind. It's a beard. I was wondering if, like, a mask was hindering something, but it's a beard. Thanks for reading today's issue of Read and React. And that's it for Sundry Sports for today. Thank you and good night.